Good afternoon uh, and welcome to this session about um, virtual reality. Uh, my name is Matthias Puschmann. I'm the managing director of Vast Media. We are a Berlin-based uh, digital media consultancy. And in this session, um, we are going to give you an update on the VR ecosystem. So in the first half of this session, um, it's all about new glasses, new platforms, social VR, and a few uh, content trends. And then the second half, uh, we'll be talking about the challenges of VR production and distribution with uh, two industry experts. We have uh, Greg Ivanov from Google and Alex Kunovic from La Duma on stage. So many uh, consider VR to be um, the next big thing uh, in entertainment. Uh, 2016 was definitely uh, the year of VR, at least it was called that way. 2017 is another year of VR. So um, what's the current state of the industry and where are we actually heading? If you look at the, the general uh, VR ecosystem, the market, uh, market has definitely matured over the um, past year. Um, there are a growing number of hardware manufacturers um, for headsets, input devices, uh, and other related equipment. Uh, devices are affordable. They come in all sizes across uh, different platforms. And there are thousands of uh, VR production companies and VR startups around the world. But there are also a lot of uh, challenges. Headset sales are uh, a bit slower than expected, and there's still a lack of qualitative uh, content. But even if we're not talking about a mass market phenomenon yet, headsets have made their way into the living rooms. Google shipped over 10 million cardboards since its launch three years ago in 2014. Um, Samsung launched their Gear VR in the fall of 2015. They've bundled their devices with smartphones, but also sold them separately. And so far, over 5 million units are in the market. PlayStation VR is based on the PlayStation console, which already has a large install basis. Um, it has officially sold around 915,000 times in the first four months since its launch in October 2016. And at the high end, um, there are two major PC-based headsets, uh, the HTC Vive, which has been sold an estimated 400,000 times in the past year, and the Oculus Rift. Uh, between 250 and 300,000 times. That's also an estimate. Um, the space is highly competitive. The Rift recently dropped their price by $200, and uh, the Vive has announced new gadgets, such as the Vive Tracker. So if you have a look at uh, the market penetration for the major devices, then not surprisingly, uh, the highest penetration is for mobile VR devices, um, so that need a smartphone uh, to work. Besides the, the well-known devices, uh, several other devices have been launched in the past months. Um, here's a selection. Um, Lenovo is um, a new competitor for the Vive and Oculus from China. It's also tethered, so it needs a, a PC, but it weighs almost half and is uh, significantly cheaper. Um, the trend goes to untethered, mainly to mobile-based headsets. Um, the LG 360 VR and uh, the new Google Daydream are both mobile-based. And even telcos now launch their own headsets. Uh, Orange has recently launched the Orange VR1, which is compatible with iOS and Android and costs uh, around 49 euros. And then there is the Pico Neo CV, which does not need an extra device at all, which is what many actually have been hoping for. Many other companies have dipped their toes into mobile VR, and several of these devices aren't bound to any specific smartphone, but work with numerous iOS and Android phones. Tracking remains a big challenge. How do you navigate these virtual worlds? Um, there are different input technologies that you can use. There are handheld motion controllers, such as the one for Daydream, for PlayStation, and the new Samsung controller. Um, then there's inside-out eye tracking or hand tracking with gloves and even full body immersion with haptic suits. And then there's a broad range of specific solutions um, such as treadmills, flight simulators, etc., used for gaming and simulations. Many of these devices need space, which obviously not everyone has at home. That's where VR arcades uh, come into play, making VR more accessible. And with Amazon slowly but steadily putting US malls out of business, there's a lot of vacant space to be filled. IMAX, for example, recently launched a VR arcade in uh, LA with uh, five to 15 minute experiences at seven to $10. Uh, but besides VR arcades, VR can also be experienced in theme parks, at exhibitions, or in cinemas. 
Um, French cinema chain MK2, for example, has started a VR cinema, which offers 20 to 40 minute VR experiences, which are fictional documentaries, simulations, and video games. They have a total of 12 VR stations with three different devices and two full body immersive simulators. Um, 40 minutes cost 20 euros, uh, 20 minutes cost 12 euros to give you um, a sense of what the pricing is. In China, uh, the tech is truly democratized through VR arcades. There are already more than 5,000 of these uh, arcades, mostly in malls, and HTC plans to open another 1,000 VR arcades in China. What are the reasons for China leading uh, the global VR market? It's the multiplication of actors uh, in the sector. There's hundreds of innovative and creative hardware and software companies, and a lot of media companies um, which are actually going beyond their nature and positioning themselves as VR platforms um, to access content. But the real battle for VR is not about hardware or application, instead it's about the platforms um, that form the foundations for both of these, um, the operating system. Currently, there are many different platforms, um, not many, but several. Uh, Oculus for Gear and Rift, Daydream, uh, Viveport for Vive, PlayStation, and then uh, the app ecosystem for mobile VR. Of course, they all have different use cases and also different target groups, but every platform and every device has different capabilities, uh, different specs, which makes it quite difficult and time consuming for developers. Um, experiences have to be adapted for each platform, um, yeah, which is a huge challenge for, for developers, actually. And often, the specific content is only available on one platform, which it makes it also complicated for uh, the consumer at the end. There's also initiatives to create open standards, uh, to create a royalty-free open API um, that will be common to all the headsets, but uh, we'll see how that actually ends up going. Besides um, the stores on each device, there are additional content hubs um, battling to become the new HBO of VR content, Jaunt, Within, Next VR, to name a few. VVR, for example, has raised a 25 million funding round last year from a number of investors, including HTC, Samsung, and Orange, to launch Transport VR, which is a new platform that aims to deliver cinematic VR experiences to a number of headsets. And then there are the likes of Sky, Discovery, Hulu, Red Bull, etc. Many SWAT services, broadcasters, and brands have launched their own VR content apps with both original, promotional, and additional VR content for on-air brands. So you can see um, the ecosystem is quite fragmented, which also enables new entrants to position themselves along uh, the line. There are many challenges to tackle and solve on all sides, uh, but one of the biggest challenges remains how do you increase the visibility of VR content? How do you enable content discovery? And of course, Facebook is here to help out. Um, They've been a huge believer in VR from the very beginning, and they're usually um, quite good at helping people discover, um, to some extent, rele uh, relevant content. After investing uh, two billion in Oculus, they've uh, slowly building, they're now slowly building in some, uh, some features into Oculus. Three weeks ago, for example, they launched a new Facebook video tab uh, in Oculus that lets you connect your Facebook and Oculus accounts to bring personal info based on who you're following to your VR headset. So there are explore and following sections which help users within these headsets to discover the most interesting and popular 360 content um, from Facebook, um, posted by media companies, from your Facebook friends, or also pages you follow. To increase the visibility of VR content and allow people to better showcase to their friends what playing in VR is like, uh, Oculus also added a live stream to Facebook button from the universal menu when you're in VR, so people can instantly start streaming um, a live stream of their VR activity uh, to their friends on Facebook. Social VR is a huge topic in general. Um, Oculus, for example, recently launched Oculus Rooms. Um, you can search by, um, by name, um, search for people for, by, by real name or by, by username, and then connect with them to see when they're online. You can start voice calls or jump into experiences uh, together. Oculus Parties, for example, lets you uh, and up to three friends, which are represented by avatars, join a voice call from anywhere um, in VR. <clears throat> so it's basically a private virtual space with your friends. Um, they also rolled out Oculus Voice, which enables users to perform voice searches um, to navigate games, apps, and experiences. 
Besides Oculus Rooms, there are several other social VR platforms. <clears throat> Allspace VR, for example, is a social VR which enables users to attend live events and play games with other users. VTime, you can also meet, chat, and share in several locations. And with Lifelike VR, um, you can watch live sports with friends. Um, the session following right after this one is actually all about social VR, so stick around afterwards. And then there's the question of content. Um, if we leave games aside for now and focus primarily on cinematic VR and entertainment VR, then there are a few different approaches when it comes to the type of VR content in the entertainment section. There are experiences that complement linear narratives, uh, like Mr. Robot's VR prequel, for example, which deals with the backstory of one of the main characters. Um, there are hybrid stories such as sci-fi's Halcyon, which contain linear TV episodes, but also VR episodes that fluently merge uh, together if you watch the crime series in a headset. And then there are VR originals, such as this BBC original, which was exclusively launched on Daydream. VR originals, which are exclusively VR and which are usually based on some sort of interactivity. Generally, there are different types of experiences. There are sensory experiences, which require a lot of interactivity, uh, game-like. Um, then there are narrative experiences that tell a story which viewers are mostly guided through, uh, which can be cinematic or documentary, and which might require some sort of interactivity. And then there are live and documentary experiences that take viewers somewhere they cannot be themselves, usually without any interactivity. So you really have to think in new dimensions in terms of storytelling. There's also a lot of momentum currently in the branded VR space with different approaches, either presenting a brand or product through a VR experience or um, the brand being featured in the immersive experience through product placement. Many of these are just one-offs, um, but these brand partnerships uh, allow production companies to uh, experiment with new forms of storytelling. At the same time, the VR community needs to work on the separation between promotional content on the one side and what is eventually worth paying for uh, by audiences on the other side. There's not a lot of budget coming from the tech giants funding content production, so it needs the, the creators to work out a healthy VR ecosystem. It's about experiments, about learning the new language of VR storytelling, and about creating compelling content which will help attract audiences. So, where are we heading with all this? Um, that's what we're going to be discussing. Um, please welcome on stage Greg Ivanov, who is uh, the head of Daydream Business Development EMEA at Google, and Alex Kunovic, who is Vice President of Strategy at cinematic VR production company La Duma. Welcome. <laughs> So maybe to, um, to start off, um, you could tell us uh, what brought you into the VR space and what your roles at Google and La Duma are all about. You can go first. Um, so what brought me to VR space? Um, I think, so I've been at Google for about six years and obviously VR is a big thing right now. So I've been doing a lot of work in Android broadly and uh, Daydream is an extension of that. So here we are. Um, and to the second part. Um, what your exact role is. Oh, what exact like, role, what, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so my exact role is to develop the um, content ecosystem on Daydream, so to have amazing, compelling um, content. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Uh, my background is more from a traditional media background, 10 years with the BBC, three years with Abu Dhabi Media Company. I was head of content at Liverpool Football Club, and I joined the company that was to become the Duma in the summer of 2015, um, and we've been public-facing for around a year, um, based in the States and in Liverpool and England. Um, my job at VP of Strategy kind of covers a myriad of things, whether it's, you know, a lot of biz dev, a lot of uh, targets of the company, looking how we're looking to develop in the next year. Um, and we work with various brands uh, in sports and entertainment, in travel, in fashion, in medical, kind of across the whole board, really. What differentiates Laduma from, from other VR production companies? I think there's several things. I think. We've got great storytellers at our company. I think some companies, that they sell themselves on the tech and not the story. And we've got great storytellers, people with uh, backgrounds for big media companies or in the movie industry. Uh, when it comes to our tech, we develop our own rigs in-house. We've got our own uh, underwater rigs. We shoot in 3D, uh, uh, stereoscopic. Um, and also we offer an end-to-end -end solution so we can create white label apps. We shoot, edit, storyboard, and deliver everything in-house. Okay.
Can you maybe share a, a few key learnings from some of your uh, projects um, producing uh, these types of uh, experiences? Yeah, sure. I think the medium is so new that we ourselves are learning all the time. I think we went through four iterations of our camera last year alone in terms of how we're developing it and improving. And every client really has, has different needs. With the LA Galaxy, they wanted to be a leader in MLS. They wanted all their content delivered through a bespoke app that we made them for iOS and Android. Um, the, uh, we did stuff with Wimbledon and NFL teams where the content was either delivered on social or the case of one F NFL team, we just purely delivered it to the fans at a big NFL street, uh, street party in Regent Street in London. Um, the resort you saw there in South Africa and BT Plains, that was about getting themselves more known outside Africa. So again, we went and created them an app um, showcasing what they can do. So er every client has had something very distinct to them about what they wanted to deliver. Now, we work with companies that want eyeballs and want big numbers on social and others that, because the experience is obviously the best in a headset, they want a very bespoke, interactive, kind of engaging experience rather, uh, which is delivered through an app. Um, besides the, the technical challenges, what are the, the, the major challenges that VR producers and creators are actually facing currently? I think every, everything that you see, every, you there's no hiding place on the camera, so in terms of how you direct people can be a real challenge. I think because you're trying things at the cutting edge all the time, not everything is always going to work exactly how you want it. And I think it's also about, it's very important to get your clients on board and engaged. I mean, the Galaxy were a good example of that. They committed to a series of films. And I think if you're thinking about going into this space or making content in this space, there's nothing worse than making a really great splash and then not following it up with anything. You know, it's about committing to VR to the point where VR becomes as, as much of a, a content habit as, say, mobile phones have become. You know, they weren't part of our content habits 15 years ago and now it are integral. So it's about working with people and clients and brands to make VR content and VR content consumption part of um, everyone's uh, daily uh, lifestyle, really. Greg, if you look at the, the distribution side, the platform side, what are the biggest challenges on, on that end? Well, I think quite clearly we have to accept that there's a lot of fragmentation, as you said. Um, so that's, that's clearly a challenge. Um, but um, I think that's basically the, main the, the only main challenge we have. Um, it's kind of echoing what Alex said, um, I just want to kind of completely back you up on that. I think, um, and this is also speaking to distribution, um, because ultimately distribution will probably unify uh, on some level at some point. Um, the way we approach VR is obviously very specific to Android and how we think about Android and Daydream being an extension of that. Um, and it's obviously a mobile VR platform. Um, but the key thing that we're trying to achieve right now is drive that recurring usage. Um, we want to get, personally at Google, we want to get past the, the kind of the cardboard the curiosity stage, as we call it, where somebody would try on a headset. I think you've probably all done it to some extent where you try it on for 30 seconds. You're like, that's pretty cool. And you put it down and you probably never pick it up again. Um, so we want to get people to use it regularly. And immersion interactivity is a part of that. And we want to get partners to think about actually why they want to do something in VR. Um, and that's kind of a big topic. So I'll, I'll just pause there and see if you have anything else. That, that, that's a very interesting point. We have people come to us that no, they want to make something in VR, but they don't necessarily know why. And we've turned clients away because either the ideas they have or the things they want to do, there's no added benefit than just delivering it as traditional video, apart from the fact they want to say they've done something in VR. So how you're thinking about telling your stories, shooting everything in circles, giving people a reason to go back and watch something again, mm. all that has to be at the heart of why you want to do something in 360 or VR. Otherwise, you might as well just stick to more traditional uh, mediums. How do you partner up with, um, with content producers? Um, how do you get your content on Daydream? What's the workflow like? Um, so I think the biggest, so you spoke that this is the year of VR, as was last year and five years ago. Um, so I think the, the one distinction I'd make um, to answer your question is, I think this year we've seen that a lot more content makers, media companies are taking VR way more seriously than they've ever done. So for us, it's quite easy, in a way, to partner with um, companies around VR content because the partners and the media companies that actually know how to do this are you know, pretty self-selective in that sense. Um, 
because let's be honest, VR is very hard, it's very expensive still, so we only want to work with you know, media companies and partners who know, ha have a way of thinking about VR, have a way of executing VR, and have a strategy there. Um, so, yeah, this is, in, in a sense, that's actually quite simple, because um, there are not that many kind of truly forward-thinking innovative companies out there, but obviously, having said that, Daydream is open as a platform for anyone to develop on. Um, but in terms of what we actually highlight and feature, and in terms of our large partnerships, we you know, have only worked with some of the top media companies like you've highlighted, like BBC, Netflix, Sky, etc. Um, I know it's, it's quite early to talk about that, but if we talk a little bit about Google's business model sometime down the road, um, you have potentially different revenue streams uh, in the future. You have you know, a small portion, which is headset sales you have. Um, basically, uh, the possibility to impose the, uh, the App Store model onto VR, you have um, the advertising world. Um, what's your take on that? Um, is, there, is, it, you know, is there something that um, you already are uh, planning inside? I mean, the, the main thing that uh, we are doing and we're thinking of is obviously the, the Play Store model that we currently have, which is all you know, around subscriptions, uh, premium apps, uh, equally advertising. I think the big difference that we see with VR and what we already kind of highlighted with some of our partnerships like CNN, um, if you look at the media model that you have right now, which is all about driving engagement online, right? So driving engagement, page views and clicks and eyeballs, it's um, competition on engagement and very fast turnover of content and, and attention. Um, in VR, I think we're seeing it's rewarding a lot more premium content um, longer engagement, long form narrative, really immersive journalism. Um, and I think the early signs is that, you know, brands, advertisers, and actually users are also a lot more willing to pay for that kind of content because actually the cost of switching in VR mode, um, from a user point of view, there's a lot more friction there, right? So online, you just go from one article to another, one video to another. In VR, it's a lot harder to do that. So actually, that I think will drive a lot more premium content, um, higher brand dollars, and perhaps you know users actually paying for content. Speaking of the users, how do you reach um, users with your content? What are the distribution strategies? Um, well, for us, there's two distinct parts to our business. One is the stuff we do with brands and clients, and then uh, we have a lot of uh, licensable content that we work with various distribution companies to uh, put into the marketplace. Um, in terms of the stuff we've done with brands and sports clubs, it, it's all comes back to the strategy of promoting heavily through social, interacting with their fans. We've had people have big um, activations at stadiums, but it's about the clear and consistent tone of the messaging to let people know that it's coming, why is it coming, why is it worth their time investing in this? Um, because what you don't want is to spend a lot of money making this content and then not getting, you know, not hitting your targets, not getting the best return on investment by not push and get enough. So it's about having that clear, concise, coherent strategy to say, we've committed to this, we're going to make X amount of films with LA Galaxy, six players, six different uh, locations, one a month that we did throughout the second half of the season. That worked really well. Their fans knew that content was coming, when to expect it, which players it was going to be. It was all very clearly signposted them. That, to me, is a good example of a strategy which you know is going to get you maximum eyeballs on, on the content that you've created. Speaking of sports, um, are you planning any live streaming VR? Is that um, something yeah, you're working we, on? Yeah, we, we can do live and we've done live. I mean, it, it depends on the sports. I mean, people always talk about sports like football, but the pitch is so big. It's, very, it's not a great experience to watch football and VR. Sports like basketball, um, boxing, UFC, the small sports with a smaller footprint lands itself to really well. But it, again, it all comes down to camera position in VR. You know, there's been clubs that have... Uh, last summer were unveiling their managers live on stage in VR, but the conversation was taking place here, the camera was over there. It's a really bad experience. So, you know, camera position has to, is integral, anything more than, say, 20 foot, and it's not going to work. So, yeah, live sports is a real, real challenge, but I still think there are certain live events that, if done properly, can work really well. Maybe a more uh, general question towards both of you. Um, what characterizes good VR, in your opinion? I think, just studying from the, from the basics, I think good VR is um, a, an experience that's well thought out in terms of actually why it is in VR. Um, so good VR has a value proposition that is unique to VR. It sounds really obvious, but it's key. 
Um, so one of the core tenets of how we think about what makes a good VR app or a good daydream app is better in VR or actually only in VR. Um, so I think that's fundamental. Um, you know, speaking of, and, and just to add to that quickly, I think there's a tendency, which is not a necessarily bad tendency as a starting point, but a lot of content producers, uh, especially kind of you know media companies that have been around for a while, uh, have a tendency to I kind of take what they have and put it in VR. So that might not it might be a good bridge to start with, but it's not the best kind of ultimate destination for VR. So something that's truly natively VR that is compelling, that has good interactivity in it, if we're speaking about interactivity. Um, yeah, I'd highlight those two, because I know we're running out of time. Uh, I think for me, as, as Craig said, then it has to be you're watching something and you're really grateful that it's in VR and you wouldn't get the same experience in, in 2D. So for us, it's about immersion. It's a, if it's in stereoscopic 360 3D, to feel that you're really in Stephen Gerrard's backyard or the middle of the Serengeti or that animal is coming right up to your face to make someone feel almost disbelieved that they are there and not in the south of France is incredibly powerful. You know, we talk about VR being used as an empathy machine and when it's done correctly, that that's the sort of level of engagement uh, and attachment you can achieve. Great. Maybe a final question, seeing the clock ticking down. Um, leading, leading over to the next session, what's your take on, on social VR? Do you think that's a huge driver to get uh, VR to become mainstream? Yes. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg <laughs> thinks so, so yes. Yeah, great. These are the final words. I think that's a good uh, lead over to, to the next session. Um, if you have any questions uh, towards the two of them or us three, we'll be sticking around. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>